mining methods using mercury not only devastate natural habitats like the rainforest, but poison the environment, community, and the global food chain. Many of these miners use mercury, which acts as a magnet to gold. When mixed together with ground gold ore, the mercury and gold bind together to form an amalgam, which is then burned, vaporizing the mercury. The burning releases dangerous mercury vapor, which condenses, settling in soil and waterways where it transforms into methyl mercury. Once in fish, it bioaccumulates across the food chain until it becomes unsafe in seafood, such as tuna, that ends up in supermarkets and restaurants around the world. Exposure to mercury, even small amounts, causes serious health problems. Peru presents a particular challenge when it comes to gold mining. It is home to the second largest area of the Amazon rainforest after Brazil and is one of the top 10 gold producers in the world. In Madre de Dios in southeastern Peru, the uncontrolled spread of artisanal gold mining resulted in a 2016 mercury emergency and has rapidly deforested wide swaths of the Amazon rainforest. The good news is that for the last five years, Pure Earth has been successfully implementing mercury-free minor trainings and begun rainforest restorations on land degraded by artisanal gold mining in Madre de Dios. Pure Earth began this working with small-scale gold miner Pedro Infantes, owner of the Paolita II mining concession. We trained him and his miners in gravimetric separation, using gravity and water in place of mercury to separate out the gold. Then Pure Earth implemented the first ever reforestation to rehabilitate rainforests degraded by gold mining in Peru on Pedro's concession. Thanks to a grant from the Tiffany & Company Foundation, Pure Earth is continuing this work with a larger mining association called Amataf, who are operating legally in the buffer zone of the Tambo Pata National Reserve. Led by Franz Cabanillas, Pure Earth's country coordinator for Peru, we just restored 2.5 hectares of land stripped by mining that is now closed. It may look simple, but this process involves choosing the correct mix of saplings, special fertilizer, proper planting technique, and follow-up monitoring to ensure success. The next step in this project is choosing the best mercury-free mining method for this particular community. Madre de Dios may be the most important region in the world to solve this problem. By refining our interventions and continued collaboration with local governments, miners, and community leaders, we can scale up and support the thousands of small-scale gold miners in Madre de Dios to become mercury-free and help restore the precious deforested land of the Amazon. Sorry, took me a minute there. <laughs> so um, I'm Jen Mary Shino, everyone. I'm uh, the uh, uh, Senior Director of Development for Pure Earth. And um, working on mercury pollution issues and fundraising for this has just become a passion for me. Um, I've been very lucky to work with a number of people in the jewelry industry. I know a lot of you are on the line um, who use um, gold and are very focused on responsibly sourcing their gold, very aware of this issue with mercury. Um, I'm really on simply to introduce Franz Cabanillas, who is on the ground in Peru and Puerto Maldonado um, is where he lives. Franz is the expert on this. He's overseeing all of our work there. Um, he is speaking in English today. His English is actually amazing, but it is his second language. But I think he's going to do a great job. So, Franz, I'm going to turn it over to you. I'm going to go back to share screen, um, and you can we'll we'll pull the presentation back up. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jen. Uh, I don't you know if you can put yes. Okay. Well, my name is Franz Cabanillas. I am the local director of Pure Earth. You know, uh, I will talk about a little uh, about about our work here in Madre de Dios. No? Next, please. Next slide, please. No.
Now, before, before, please, the first one with a map of, yes. Well, uh, no, the, the next, next one. Okay, thanks. Yes, uh, we work in Peru since 2015, you know. Uh, well, if you know Peru, it's a South American country. We are next to Brazil, Colombia, Ecuador, and in the south with Bolivia and Chile. You know, we work in the Madre de Dios region. It's a southeast Amazon region. Next, please. You can see uh, Madre de Dios is, is considered the, the biodiversity capital of Peru. No, and it's a very, very important place for the biodiversity, for the research. And in the other side, you have many, many use of land in, that, in the same territory that it, it became in a lot of uh, conflicts. No? We have many, many uh, productive activities in the same place. No? There are a very, very big problem for the uh, territory. Next, please. And what is the context of the gold mining in Madre de Dios? No, we have uh, two different forms that the gold mining it, it uh, does. No, the first is that illegal gold mining is a very very uh, big problem for the government. It's a, one of the biggest socio socioeconomic problems in Peru. No, in 2019, the government implements uh, Operation Mercury. It's a military operation in Madre de Dios. Uh, to eradicate the illegal gold mining in one sector of uh, Madre de Dios, that it calls La Pampa, no? And in another way, we have the formal and informal gold mining. Uh, there are the, the group of miners, uh, we work with, with that kind of miners, that they want to do the things better, no? Uh, yes, the next, please. Um, what are the environmental impacts, no? We have, in one way, uh, a, a big deforestation from uh, mining in, in Madre de Dios, but it's not only deforestation, also it's degraded uh, degradation. No? We have more than 100,000 uh, 100, uh, deforested and highly degraded areas, no? only uh, in uh, accumulate to 2018. Next, please. And also a big, big problem is uh, the use of mercury. No? Only uh, in one year, approximately, uh, the artisanal gold mining released 185 tons of mercury only in Madre de Dios. No, you can see that the big problem that there is. Next, please. And what Pirel proposed for that kind of problems? No, what is the, the solution that we can we want to, to, to propose? One is the mercury free technologies. No? You can see in the picture, no, a mercury-free Filipino method with borax that is best for the artisanal and or subsistence miners. It's cheap, very easy access and very easy way to, to do that kind of method for that kind of uh, scale. No? And in, uh, in the other picture, you can see a shaking table is best for the small scale miners. And with that kind of, of solution, we, we, we get, we know that <laughs> we knew a Pedro Infantes, and right now Pedro Infantes is the first miner to produce gold without any, any mercury in the process, no? Uh, next, please. We can see those pictures, no? We have Andrea, is a very, very good friend of, of us, no? Andrea is a jewelry, and, and she, she bought the, uh, the gold for, for, from Pedro Infantes, the, a piece of gold, you can see the piece of gold in the right, in the picture of the right, no? Uh, without any, any mercury, no? Next, please. And what else? What else Pierre uh, proposed for the for these problems? No, uh, a mine closure specific for the gold mining in the Amazon. No, why is important the mine closure? Uh, in the first in the, in the legislation, the mine closure is an obligation for the formal miners. No, in Madre de Dios we have two hundred eight formal miners and uh, five thousand in a route of formalization. No, we apply the methodology of Cincia. Cincia is a center of, uh, for Amazonian scientific innovation. It's an institution uh, in Madre de Dios that they, they do the, the research. And uh, with that methodology, we install the first mine closure models that will serve to many, many, many other miners, no? In three formal mining concessions, no? Next, please. We can see the pictures of our work. We can see the plan. I don't know if you, you can see that in the right, the picture in the right is, is, a, is a plan that we, we planted. That it has 
I, I don't know, two years, no? It's a very, very important results that we have, you know? Uh, this is Imperial Infantes concessions, no? It's a, it's, a, it's a plot that we have there. Uh, next, please, next slide. And this is our work in February of this year in Amatav concession, no? We can see that the work with the same miners, no? We, we period work uh, hand of hand with the miners, no? It's a very, very important thing that I, I, I want to, to, to say, no? And next, please. And for, for talk about the context of COVID, what, what happened in Peru? In, uh, since March 15 of this year, we, we are in a state of emergency in Peru for 90 days. And in March 16th, we have a quarantine no? until April 26. No? Uh, isolation, curfew, closure of borders, airports, and private transit. No? And what happened with artisanal gold mining in Peru? Uh, they stopped, the activity stopped, it's paralyzed, no? Uh, lots of unsold gold, no formal buyers, black market, and low producer prices, no? But in the international price remains the same. You can see in the table, no? What is the importance of the artisanal gold mining in Madre de Dios? Uh, more or less 74% of the, the population, economic population, uh, economically active population, uh, it works in a artisanal gold mining. It's a lot, a lot of people, no? And uh, next slide, please. And here you can see in the all supply chain and all in the payment chain what happened, no? And what uh, is, is the effect of COVID in artisanal gold mining in Peru, no? It, there is a very, very uh, important, very, very important. Uh, thing that happened after the COVID in the artisanal gold mining. No, the government has, it must to, to do some, some kind of, of, of measures to, uh, to help the artisanal gold mining. No? And it's all, if you have any question, we, we can talk about later. Thank you very much. Franz, thank you very much. That was great. Um, wonderful to see all this. So, we welcome questions again in that little Q&A box. Um, you know, the, the major challenge we find uh, here is that people are just not aware about the scope of this issue particularly. And uh, the more that we can bring attention to this, pointing out that this is how the majority of mercury poisonings that occur in the US come about. It starts up in the mountains or in the rainforest um, with artisanal gold mining and that mercury then ends up getting into the fish that cause the majority of the uh, mercury poisonings that you see in the US. We've got a couple of questions here first. Um, Stephanie has asked whether Pure Earth engages with multinational companies and their supply chains in terms of human rights and environmental due diligence. So Jen, I wonder if you'd be able to reply to that given all of the work that you've been doing, especially within the jewelry industry? Um, so do we work with multinational organizations? I mean, essentially, our work is really focused on um, preventing the negative health effects of mercury on people. So yeah. what we're really focused on is doing this on the ground work, getting the funding for it. Um, we, and the, the larger companies are not necessarily sourcing from artisanal gold, mine, gold miners. Um, and a lot of the larger gold mining companies are aware and trying to do the right thing. So I don't know, I'm not sure if that really totally answered the question, but primarily, you know, our work is focused on, like I said, doing this on the ground work, preventing the mercury pollution in these very small scale mines. Um, and then trying to stay engaged in various things taking place within the jewelry industry that are focused on sourcing and sort of moving the needle even on the consumer side of things. That's a quick answer to that. Thanks, Jen. That's a good start. Um, Franz, were people in Peru reluctant to change from the traditional methods to obtain gold? And are there high maintenance costs and who pays them? Sorry, I, I you can I, repeat um, for the change from the old way of, of using mercury to go to the new way. Was it difficult to change and was uh, there okay. cost for the people? 
I think that yes, it's a little bit difficult because uh, the mercury is not pro pro prohibited here in, in Peru. It's, it's legal to work with mercury, no? And it's for that that if, if the government of uh, another institution uh, don't find some way to, to give incentive to change that, I think that we are in a, in a, in a very difficult challenge to do that, no? It's for that, we, we discovered that with, with this project, no? It's a very, very interesting way uh, for example, to work with, with jewelry, you no, know, to, to, to buy this clean gold, you no. Know? The government it began to, to do some kind of effort, but uh, we are in the beginning of that, you no. Know? Oh, okay, thanks, Franz. And we are running a little behind. So what I'd like to do now is to um, take those other questions and answer them separately offline. But turn over now to Dr. Caravanos, who's uh, our esteemed uh, Director of Research and at NYU. And Jack, could you um, give us an update uh, of all your intelligence about COVID and especially how it relates to pollution? Yes, uh, thank you everybody for having me. And I'm always uh, proud to be part of the Pure Earth team. And especially in this time of COVID and what's going on with all the, uh, the numbers you've been seeing and the trends and the impact on pollution and all this. So uh, let's start. I have a presentation here for you and we'll have plenty of time for questions. So uh, I want to start first with some disease rates and uh, the disease rates here, I think I'll start with, uh, I'm sorry, I'll start with the global and you see that almost every country has been in, uh, affected in some way or another and this is um, the, the reality of our global world. Everybody is traveling so much, uh, I've been to Peru many times. I love Madre de Dios. I have some good memories there. But of course, uh, all this has its cost when, when it comes to spreading a disease. The, um, I want to start with, uh, let's see, let me start with, uh, let me just move this uh, bar here. Thank you. Um, okay, start with countries that seem to be on the, uh, on the rebound, uh, Germany, Peru, Madagascar, China, these are countries that seem to have gone over the hump and are, are sort of reducing their number of cases. Of course, we are worried about the disease coming back. Uh, we'll know soon enough how true that is when some of these countries open up more and more. Uh, we see a little of it in China, but they seem to have gotten a hold of it. And the nice thing is Peru is also coming, uh, sort of coming out of it. Uh, by the way, keep an eye on some of the numbers on the left because some are in thousands and some like Madagascar, you see 10, 15 people. So even though the curves seem to be similar uh, in height, the numbers of cases are very different. Now, when we look at other countries that we work in or have experience in, Mexico, Kenya, uh, uh, Turkey, India, we see that it's still not certain how much more of the disease we'll see and whether that drop will be sudden or whether it'll tail down over many months. But it obviously is impacting tremendous amount of, uh, of people and lives, and especially very sensitive, informal workforce that is where we do our work in Pure Earth. I'll get into that later on. So let me tell you about New York uh, City. Uh, this is uh, along the theme of, uh, of uh, Rich Fuller's uh, slide, where we have the Empire State Building. That is a pulsing image every night from my house, uh, sort of a heartbeat. It's a little scary sometimes, but um, it is a pretty amazing sight. In New York City, you can see that the number of cases are phenomenal. Uh, this is just 8 million people in New York City, 134,000 cases. The red line represents a, about a month. So you see that uh, we've had a bad month uh, and there's no way around it. But the good news is the number of cases have fallen down tremendously. and um, and soon enough, I think we'll be down to almost background levels, but then we'll have to deal with the damage. The, the dips you see there are interesting because they're the weekends and it's, a, it's an issue of recording uh, cases. Uh, the, you tend to record them on Monday morning, so the weekend numbers get carried over to the next week. If you look at the deaths due to COVID, it's also a, a sad story. 10% of those cases uh, end up dying. 
14,000 people so far as of yesterday in New York City died. But look at what happened yesterday. Barely, an, barely a significant number of cases. We're pretty much at the end. And the social distancing has really worked. It has a price to it, of course, we all know that. But it does seem that we're over the hump for New York City, uh, New York State, New Jersey is a little bit uh, more complicated. Um, so who is dying? Well, we all have heard this before. It's uh, older people are by far the highest risks, uh, 75, 75 years and over. Uh, and you see really from 65 years, the numbers tend to go uh, quite high. You do see young kids dying, but that's usually because of some existing disease. And when you look at who is dying as far as comorbidities, uh, you see that one or more chronic diseases puts you at very high risk. If you could appreciate this image, 86% of the people that have perished have one of these diseases or one or more. And very often they come in, in pairs. Uh, hypertension, diabetes, and, and if you look at the orange uh, arrows here, these are the diseases that are strongly linked conclusively to environmental agents. Uh, renal disease, especially when it comes to mercury. So a population that is, that is impacted with other hazards, air pollution, mercury, are way more susceptible to this disease. Um, and this is why overall chronic disease health management is what's important. Uh, so by the way, some of these terms here, dementia, of course, uh, COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, cancer, which is a very large class of disease. And this, this ratio of 86% is pretty common throughout all COVID cases uh, uh, throughout the world. Uh, as far as environmental improvement, what do we have here? Well, interesting that COVID has produced some wonderful observations. Uh, the Grand Canal in Venice is swimmable. Look at this water. Of course, there's no one on the streets or in Venice at all. But it is remarkable how in a short amount of time, the environmental gains can be so powerful. I, I, have, I must say I was shocked at how quickly the environment re was restored. Uh, we saw this in air pollution levels. On the left, you have Italy in 2019. On the right, Italy about a year later. Uh, obviously, this is intense air pollution, nitrous oxides, uh, which is an air pollution uh, irritant, a human uh, a respiratory irritant, and you could see the tremendous declines. But let me say that <clears throat> these declines are temporary, and the quantity of health benefit you get in this narrow point is really negligible when you compare a lifetime of exposure. So yes, these levels that have gone down are, are impacting human health much less. How many lives will be saved? A certain number. Compare that to the overall last 20 years of air pollution in Europe, it's not a very big number, meaning uh, the difference is by far uh, uh, very small. Uh, it's, it's a very big difference in the sense that there's many more people that have died in the past from air pollution. Uh, India is an amazing example. Uh, I, um, I don't have pictures of Madre de Dios. There's not too much pollution in Madre de Dios, air pollution that is. So I don't have good images there. But this is a wonderful image showing uh, uh, air pollution in Delhi on the left, historical levels. That's how I remember it. And on the right, Delhi now has a blue sky. So um, you could look up some of these articles in The Guardian. There's plenty of wonderful articles about these uh, wonderful environmental gains. But there's also a price. And what you see here is a timeline of, of air pollution sort of at its worst in January. China pretty much closed down late January. Uh, and then as it progressed, you could see how much cleaner the air got, less orange and reds. But then March 8th, you saw the levels coming back up. So it, it is unfortunate that we're going back to, hopefully we won't go back to the original levels, but it's quite possible we're gonna go right back to where we were pre-COVID. And the question is how to stop that, how to impact that. Uh, so putting this all together, what we have 
and what we do here at Pure Earth is, is we have pollution. And we, we identify it, we try to manage it, we try to uh, communicate people, we try to implement interventions because we know pollution causes disease. Uh, this is indisputable. Uh, there's no doubt with what mercury does uh, with disease. And of course, the key lesson here is that if you are ill uh, with a chronic disease, you're now more susceptible, vastly more susceptible to other diseases, especially COVID. So what we want to do is really put an X on that pollution. We want to stop that first box so that we don't get disease, or at least minimize it to the extent possible. Uh, the, the unfortunate thing in many of our environments uh, and is, is who's affected. And the ASGM world in Peru is, is hundreds of thousands of people. Entire villages, Franz will tell you, just live on ASGM activities and income. Everybody, people from farming to selling tools to doing the mining. It's a big industry. Many people are affected. And of course, these are families that are not uh, in a formal sector, the informal sector, no health insurance, no medical access, living in dilapidated housing, barely making ends meet, dietary stress, on and on and on. So the harm is quite disproportionate to these, uh, these populations of informal workers. Uh, well, I think that may be it for me. I'll be here, of course, to answer any of your questions uh, and sort of uh, put things in perspective on this wonderful Earth Day between COVID, what Pure Earth does, and, um, and some of our activities. Thank you very much. Jack, thanks. That was really clear. So I think we really get that link between you know, avoiding toxins and what's happening here. There's these two pieces to it. One is where, unfortunately, when we all lock down, pollution goes away. People now are starting to see they've got clean air and blue sky. And the, the thought that, you know, there's hundreds of millions of children who have grown up in Delhi and for the first time they've seen blue sky, it just is a extraordinary thing but the cost of that is extraordinary and so how to be able to you know make sure that policymakers recognize that we ought to you know, lock in those savings as we move to the next step of opening up economies we're really pushing hard to see how we uh, how we can do that as well um there's a few extra questions uh that let me um bring up as well uh, Danielle asks you, Franz, um, he would like to know if you use native plants in the reforestation and how you choose which plants to use. Can you, uh, are you still there? Good. And yes. Sorry, is, is, uh, if we use native species and the, the other question it was. And then how I, do you choose the native species? Ah, uh, okay. Yes, we use native species, species but uh, we, we use some kind of uh, previous information that CINCIA, uh, CINCIA is an institution that uh, it, uh, it does the research in that kind of, of, of subject, no? the, the research in, in degraded areas for mining, gold mining. And they, they, uh, they worked since 2016. They have so many information, and we we took some kind of information for the selection of the, the that kind of species. No, it's, it's for that that we use uh, this kind of species. Also, the distribution of the species uh, it has some kind of of research um, inside. No. Yeah, and so we we rely as we do everywhere around the world on on local groups and local experts. Um, and Sincencia is the go-to group for reforestation in this part of the world. And have done a lot of research on what's appropriate. And it always seems to be local species that are appropriate, from my experience anyway, in other deforest reforestation projects. So thanks, Franz, very much. You're welcome. Uh, Marco Zato has a question about whether, when we're doing a project, um, do we need to make an assessment or decontaminate the site from mercury before we, before we begin? Um, and um, 
So Jack, you may be the best to answer that, having had a lot of experience. These Mercury sites, do we need to do a technical assessment or is the Mercury mostly already moved out of the region in water and air? Yes, the, um, the mercury contamination is not as widespread as you may think. When you see the deforestation uh, that Franz showed you, this is a horrible ecological event, but it's not like that entire area is covered with mercury. The mercury is primarily uh, contaminating the villages where you're doing the extraction. Very often the concentrated ore will come to a village and they'll use mercury uh, amalgamation to extract the gold from that uh, ore. And I've seen this done outside. I've seen it done inside. Uh, Madre de Dios is, of course, a tropical climate, so it's usually done outside. And that entire area, and sometimes the entire village, uh, is contaminated, meaning we take readings in the soil and we find that the... Um, the soil levels are very high. We do vapor mercury sampling inside people's homes because then they carry that soil, which is contaminated into their homes and they spread it. So, uh, so we have an ecological de devastation of the land and then we have a local, uh, uh, sometimes a distinct contamination of the homes and businesses and the villages where a lot of this goes on. Um, Franz may also have some comments on this, yeah. Uh, yes, yes, I agree with Jack. And also in the field, uh, we, we found that the, um, in, in, the, in the soil that you saw in the, this picture, no? like, like a sandy soil, no? we, we can, we can uh, realize that there, the concentration in the most of places, the concentration of mercury, it, it was not so, so high, no? because the mercury is, is some kind, uh, it's some kind of, of uh, it's a metal, not that uh, the, the, the temperature for, for evaporate maybe is, is not, not too high, no? And the, the, the weather in Madre de Dios, the temperature is very, very high, no? We, we try to find uh, what happened with that, but in the soil that we planted the plants, the, the concentration of mercury is not uh, too, too high. The, the level, it, it was permitted for the regulation uh, in, in Peru, no? It's for that that we don't uh, did some kind of remediation uh, action, no? Very good, very good. Thank you very much, guys. Um, there's two more questions I'll try and I just want to get to a quick one. Are there any health effects from using borax? And the answer is uh, no. Borax is uh, what's used in a detergent and powder and it's also used when you're making slime, as I know very well from my 13-year-old. And it can be slightly toxic at very high concentrations and cause a little bit of skin irritation. But in general, it's a comparative to mercury. It's a, it's really non-toxic. Um, I want to just go to Laya's last question, which is, how can we convince governments to keep low levels of pollution after COVID? Um, and her point is, they're only willing to activate, reactivate the economy and create jobs again. And I think this is really kind of one of the things that is at the heart of, the, of, of, of our pursuits of, of through Earth Day, is how do we do this? And the answer is, we don't really know. It's really complex. And we hope we can generate enough uh, social pressure or enough social pressure is just generated in the high, these highly toxic places that, there, that when people see the blue sky or they see that their river is clean for once, the Ganges, for example, you can swim in for the first time in, uh, you know, recorded history almost. Uh, when they see this, we hope that will put the right kind of pressure on policymakers. Specifically, um, you know, uh, uh, Cecilia is making a great point here. She's saying that change starts with yourself. And that clearly is something that we look to inculcate in people who are living in these highly toxic locations that they're gonna take responsibility for doing this themselves. And for us, from our perspective, we're creating a lot of um, uh, press energy around specific tangible things that can be done to maintain these savings and bringing out a, a small report talking about what are the tangible air pollution 
objectives that can be implemented now that will substantially reduce pollution. So we're trying to do our best in all this and very, very keen to have all of your feedback on this as well. So if you have some great ideas, we want to try and get them out into the world. Do let us know on other ways we can do that. Mm -hmm. I think, Jen, we're out of time, except I want to just go to Carol for a last uh, piece of work to talk to you about Pura for one last piece. So Carol, I'm sorry that I cut you a little bit short, but you probably have the most important part to do here. So over to you. Carol? Yeah. Yes, hello. Can everybody see? Yeah, so what's really important is how can you help? And there's a lot of ways that you can. Um, our goal at Pure Earth, we are a catalyst for change. And as you're seeing here with the important research and the Lancet report and that data coming out, the work that France is doing around mercury and gold mining, it's a catalyst for change. And you all can help us be that catalyst. Uh, keep learning, first of all. We're going to be doing more of these webinars. We want you tuning in. Hopefully, we'll be doing some in-person meetings and, and, and events like our Pure Earth Dirty Talks, and that will be coming in the, in the coming weeks and months when we're all out of quarantine. But also, um, we can, oh, let me get this. Donating to really important work, any level gift is so, so critical. A thousand dollars cleans up a contaminated site. You can help us clean up homes. We can monitor the, the levels of, of kids and families and, 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 and see how the interventions are working. So we're gonna be putting um, in the chat room uh, links on how you can donate uh, at any point in time. And we are so grateful for our board of directors. They uh, have done a dollar for dollar match. So your gifts are even worth more now. And we um, have ways that you can get involved in the future. And <laughs> it's not clicking through. And by the way, this dollar for dollar is just for today. So this is a great time to uh, make a contribution to us while our board is being so delightfully generous. Yeah, and then we also have our big benefit on June 29th. It is gonna happen rain or shine, virtual or hopefully at the Edison Ballroom in New York City, but a really wonderful and important event. And we also have some really cool online opportunities where folks can bid for mercury-free, socially, responsibly sourced, responsibly sourced jewelry. Here's some beautiful earrings that were donated by Futura last year. And there's going to be a whole uh, group of wonderful jewelry that people can bid on. And this year we're going to be having um, globes that have been designed from artists around the world. This is Chemos from Senegal, just a, a beautiful way to uh, consider the earth and, and be, and, and it's their concept of a pure earth. We really thank you all for coming today. And we have one more webinar. We have our cocktail webinar. So everybody bring your wine glass or your shot glass or whatever you want. And we're gonna be at five o'clock and you can register for that if you go on our website, it's not too late. And thank you again, and we will see you soon. So until five o'clock, bye-bye. Thank you all, thank you for all for coming. Been a pleasure. Bye bye. Peace. Thank you, everybody. Take care, Rich. Take care, Franz, yeah. Jen, Carol. Thank you, yeah. Thank you Sideways France. Bye bye. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. So that was